communion, friends. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Thank you for coming out on this uh, Monday, Thursday evening as we have a little warmer now and we are heading into summer. I really thank you for coming to join us in this most solemn and important uh, evening in the church's year. Uh, this is only the second year that Morrison Chapel, we had Monday, Thursday service. We had our first one last year. We had about 40 people came. Um, uh, and uh, this is our second attempt. So, um, so thank you for coming to join us. I hope that we can build up the culture of celebrating uh, all of the Easter uh, services. Tonight is especially important one as it combines the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist and it really lays the foundation for the coming events of Good Friday and Easter. Monday Thursday marks the beginning of the three-day observance of the death and resurrection of Jesus. This is the first part of a continuous rite which encompasses the liturgy of the Lord's Passion on Good Friday, the Vigil of Easter on Saturday, and the celebration of the Resurrection on Sunday morning. The Monday refers to the act of humility, repentance, and renewal that reminds worshippers of their baptism and of their identification with Christ in his death, of which the Passion is the solemn commemoration. It brings to its conclusion the penitential discipline of Lent, so technically, I think this is the end of, of Lent as we break our fast with the, the Lord's Supper. Although Anglicans usually see Good Friday as the end of the fasting. And it prepares us for the celebration of new life at Easter. This act tonight may be followed by sprinkling the congregation or, or washing the feet. And so tonight we're going to wash symbolically three, uh, three of our, our members' feet. Um, let us please stand. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is our resurrection, our salvation, and our life. We sing hymn number 478, My Song is Love Unknown.
one again, my song. Let us turn to the prayer book to page one as we join together in our opening prayer, the Collect for Pure Hearts. We say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. We join together in saying the Gloria in Excelsis. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. The Lord be with you. We turn to page 2 in the bulletin for the theme prayer, the Collect for Monday Thursday. Let us pray aloud together as we say, God, our Father, as you invite us to share in the supper that your Son gave to his church to proclaim his death until he comes, inspire us by his service and unite us in his love, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Please be seated for the Old Testament reading, uh, which is read to us by Pastor Chris tonight. Thank you, Chris. Welcome back. Good evening. Good evening. We read from Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 to 14, titled The Passover and the Festival of Unleavened Bread. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people they are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boil in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt, and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. 
The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Chris, for reading to us so passionately of this first Passover 4,000 years ago and that uh, the people of Israel are still celebrating uh, to this day. And um, this is, of course, a remembrance. They are told to commemorate the Lord's Passover. And it is also a meal, a gathering around a table to eat the Passover lamb. Let us turn to Psalm 119 on page 3 in your bulletin, and we will say it from side to side by whole verses beginning on this side. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. My heart, I said, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle reading from 1 Corinthians is read by Mr. Jury. The second reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed it on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For wherever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Crystal. Again, you can see that we have instituted a commemoration, a practice that uh, Christians to this day, 2,000 years later, are still celebrating as they gather around a table and they celebrate the meal of a different sort of lamb of God. Let us stand and sing uh, an upper room with the lovely English folk tune, Wally Wally. Yeah. 
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John, chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. If I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will glorify the Son in Himself, and will glorify Him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. But a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks that we can gather here this evening around your table to remember you. And we hope and pray that we may may remember the mandare, the command to love one another for your sake. Help us at very least in our Christian life to do this one thing, that we may be known as a people who love others. Forgive us when we fail and strengthen us to do better. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated, dear friends. We will have the uh, sermon and then the, the mondi, the uh, act of humility and repentance. Tonight, um, believe it or not, because I've only done the service uh, twice now here in in um, Morrison Church and in this parish. Uh, This service tonight is one of my favorite services from my childhood. I think that when I was first here, I kind of balked at the workload. Uh, When I was little, I attended uh, the biggest inner city Anglican church in Canberra, in the national capital. The building itself wasn't very big. It only held 200 people. But we had many, many services. And we had overflow services in the parish hall, as one does, as churches do. And um, people came from all over Canberra to that church because it was historic and well-established 
And also they had multiple clergy, they had five or six clergy. So every Easter they would have services every day throughout Holy Week and they would certainly have special services on Monday, Thursday. They would have the long vigil on Good Friday and uh, the, the Saturday night lighting of the new fire and of the vigil through into Easter morning. Dawn services Easter morning as well as the regular family services. It was a huge production. And they were able to do it because they had many clergy. But here I'm just one. And you all helped me tremendously. But when I came here, I, I decided to gradually build up the practice and celebration of the traditional Anglican services. And we've done that each year. Over time, we've added different parts of the Anglican tradition of the commemoration, and Protestant tradition, Catholic tradition of the commemoration of the, the life of Christ throughout the year. Tonight, we recall the history of the Passover in which God's hand leads the Hebrew people out of bondage of slavery through the blood of the unblemished lamb. And tonight we recall the history of the Last Supper in which God's hand leads the disciples and you and I out of years of slavery to sin and evil through the body and blood of another lamb, the Lamb of God in Jesus Christ, to the promised land. Tonight is one holy night when the sacraments, the mystery of God's working hands of the communion, or the, uh, slash the Passover, and of the baptism and the washing of feet come together in one liturgy. We have tonight a kind of foretaste of the Christian experience of baptism and communion, and a celebration of them, excuse me, a celebration of, of them both. It's uh, amusing that Jesus said to Peter, he wanted to wash his feet, feet and Peter said, no, Lord, because tonight I, I said to Grace that I wanted to wash her feet because she is, Grace is my employee. And so I thought I should wash Grace's feet. And she said, no, Patty, you cannot wash my feet. And, uh, and I said, why? Is there something wrong with your feet? And, uh, she said, no, it's not that. She said, I wouldn't feel comfortable for you to wash my feet. So she was expressing the same humility that Peter felt, which is natural. None of us want someone else to wash our feet because it's an act of a servant. And that's why Grace reacted. She, she uh, respected me and didn't want me as her pastor to be down on my knees washing her feet. But Crystal and I prevailed upon her and we sa I said, you are the very person whose feet I have to wash because she is the one who cleans our home and looks after us and serves us. So therefore, uh, Grace is the one that, that I have to wash her feet and also my wife. But there is a third spot empty for a mystery guest. And I, I was thinking that it should be someone male because we have two ladies. And perhaps it should be someone younger because we have two adults. And we have two Asians so it should be someone who's a bit of a guilo. So I think it's Mark. I think that would be the obvious. <laughs> I think Mark would be the obvious candidate. To, uh, to win the mystery uh, seat uh, tonight, uh, tonight's uh, foot washing. So be, be prepared, Mark. I hope you had a shower last night. So it's interesting, though, that, that Grace, I, I'm glad that Grace didn't say the second part of Peter's dialogue. She didn't say, oh, well, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Uh, I would have been taken aback if she'd said that. That would have been difficult. Well, we could arrange anything, I suppose. So, um, so thank you, Grace, for reminding us. None of us would want to be in that position. None of us want to have our feet washed. And it's always the difficulty of a service like this is that nobody wants to be the one receiving. We all want, uh, as Christians especially, to be the one serving. As I come to this night of Monday, Thursday, and indeed as I come to the, the three days of Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, four days, um, it always puts me in, in a very moody mood. I, I feel not a bad mood, but a mellow mood. I feel moved by the passion and the sacrifice of Christ. And I, I'm reminded of my sin that, that nailed him there. And I, and I feel quite mellow. And it, 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 the services don't have the sort of intensity and excitement of the Christmas services. Uh, Monday, Thursday and Good Friday are really mellow services. And there's a great deal of singing, as you know, on Good Friday we have songs and readings. And the songs are very mellow songs, like we've just sung, My Song is Love Unknown. And you can just relax into them like falling into a warm bath. That's how it feels to me. 
when I sing my song is it's, I think it's probably my, been my favorite hymn of all time, my song is Love Unknown. This beautiful description of Jesus as our, our friend who loves us so much. And so when I come to this season, I don't really feel like analyzing and, you know, that there are sermons for Good Friday where, where you, can, um, you can go through all the detail of what happened on the cross and how he suffered and all the medical description of, of the nailing of the cross and all that. And you can analyze all the events of the week. And I think emotionally and spiritually, I'm not inclined to do that with Holy Week. I'm just inclined to kind of almost lay back and relax and let it wash over me. And fortunately for Monday, Thursday and Good Friday, you can kind of do that because it's not too complicated and the music team does all the work. So, so uh, Mr. A and the music team, Mary, are going to be doing all the work tomorrow. Uh, it, and that's really the service is in the readings and the songs. So as a service leader, I can sort of relax a little bit and just let those wonderful readings and prophecies and songs wash over me. So tonight, I didn't want you so much to think analytically about Monday Thursday as to experience a taste of it. And I was reminded of an episode of MASH. Remember the, was it the 477 MASH, the 70s TV sitcom about the group of doctors and nurses who were trying to make sense of their assignment to a medical unit near the front lines of the Korean War. And the show does a wonderful job of combining the horror of life with the humor of life. In one particular episode, the, the doctor, who's the sort of the, um, I don't know how to describe him, the anti-hero, Major Charles Everson Winchester, uh, he's a Bostonite, and he's a graduate of Harvard. So he's a little bit of a snob, and he's very proud of himself. And he protects himself from the horror of war and suffering by surrounding himself with classical music and pampering himself with hot tubs and trying to enjoy luxuries sent to him from home in Boston. He's not very popular with the other guys, uh, but he is part of the crew. In this one particular episode, the things that normally soothe him in the midst of the trauma of war don't work. He kind of freaks out at one point, and he's trying to figure out the meaning of what's going on. There's so much senseless suffering that he's confronted with, as we are today, as we, we look on the news and we see the senseless suffering uh, in Ukraine with the war and the terrible reports that are coming out about that, as well as the suffering that we've been through in the world in the last few years with the pandemic. So Major Charles Winchester is in desperation and he leaves the base hospital and he goes directly to the front line of the war to try to find answers to his questions of why. Why all the pain? It's what theologians and sermon writers call the big why. He goes to the front line, to the source of suffering, to face the destruction and the tragedy that's taking place there, hoping to find an answer to the question of why is this happening to him and to the people he has to treat and do surgery on. While he's at the front, Major Winchester finds a young soldier who's in pain, he's been wounded, and he's crying out in pain that would send shivers down your spine. And the soldier is, is dying, and he cries out, I can't see. I can't see anything. Hold my hand. Someone hold my hand. And Charles grabs his hand and the soldier says, I'm dying. And Major Winchester, Winchester, who's grasping for answers to the meaning of life, says, what do you see? Can you see anyone? Can you see anything? Can you feel anything? Uh, what are you experiencing? What do you see? I have to know. Tell me. I want to know. What do you see? He's so caught up in his own trauma that he's forgotten about the young man is the one who's dying. It's a very Winchester moment, if you know the, the series. And here's the point. The dying sh soldier, who has just wanted to hold someone's hand and be comforted, answers none of his questions. By the way, you know, in hospitals, the hospice nurses do report that it's very common when people are dying that they see dead loved ones and they see figures of Christ and so on. These kind of experiences of, of near death are very, very common. And it's actually now part of the training of hospice nurses that they, they train them to be prepared, that people will tell them when they're dying that, that they can see uh, the dead and they can see the Lord and they can see their loved ones. Anyway, back to Major Winchester in the front lines. And he's holding the soldier's dying hand and shaking him and saying, what do you see? Tell me, what, what's it like there? And the dying soldier 
simply manages to gasp out of his mouth before he dies, I smell bread, I smell bread, and then he passes away. What Major Winchester wants, what he craves, is, is an answer. He is a philosopher, he's an intellectual. He wants an intellectual answer to the pain, the big why, the tragedy that's unfolding around him. Can you see anything? Can you feel anything? What's going on there? I have to know, says Winchester. And what he gets instead is a fragrance. What he gets is the holding of a hand, a symbol, an image, an experience. The scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. All the dying soldier can say in the midst of his suffering and pain as he departs this life is, I smell bread. I like that. I smell bread. Maybe it's the smell of Jesus, the bread of heaven, or the smell of the wedding feast of the Lamb as he goes home to be with his Lord. Or maybe it's the manna of the promised land of heaven, or maybe it's the smell of his grandma's kitchen coming back to him as he passes away. Haven't we all felt like Charles? Why is this happening? Why are we seeing these terrible things? Why do people do these things to each other? Why is there this pandemic in the world? Overwhelmed by the pain and the suffering that surrounds us. Questions come out about our situation and about the difficulty of life. Jesus is about to face the cross. His disciples are about to go through a terrible experience of trauma where they're about to see their Lord arrested, tortured, put on trial, tortured and crucified. They must have had so many questions. And what he offers them is a taste, a taste of comfort, a washing of feet, a breaking of bread, a cup of wine. Sometimes in extremis we need comfort food. We need someone to hold our hand. We need to taste and see that the Lord is good. We need to smell the bread of heaven. We are creatures that need symbol, images, sacraments. Sometimes it's not enough to be told it'll be okay. We need more than an analytical sermon. We need something we can touch and taste and see and smell. We need an experience of the living and risen Christ. We need to be comforted. The Lord comforts us through the sacraments, through the feeling of water that washes our body and washes away the sin of the world, through the taste of the bread and the wine, his body broken, and his blood shed. He comes to us in tangible terms and in the love and the embrace of the greeting of the peace and the hugs of our fellow travelers, in the holding of a hand and the greeting of peace. So on this Monday, Thursday, the readings are enough for me. It's enough stimulation for my brain. I'm not going to teach about the story of the Exodus and the Passover and the plagues and all of it, what it means to us and how it correlates with Jesus and the Lamb of God and, and all of that. I simply want to ask you to reflect on the experience of this holy night. There's an old joke in an Anglican church service that the main event for Anglicans is the tea time afterwards. It's not actually the church service, but the event afterwards, which in Australia we affectionately refer to as the bun fight. The bun fight is where everybody goes to get the best buns or biscuits after the church service, especially the children. I must say, in our case, we're going to be having a bun fight tomorrow after over our hot cross buns. Think about a time, I invite you, as I can't draw this to a close, to think about a time when you gathered around a table in remembrance. When was the last time you gathered with your loved ones, your family, around a table to remember? Where was the table? Who was there? Who was missing? What was the conversation about? What were your remembrances as you gathered around that table? It seems to me that we are always, as human beings, gathering around tables in remembrance. It's something we just do. It feels right. It's natural. It's almost holy and important. There's a sacredness about it that our secular friends understand in practice, but maybe they don't understand intellectually. I'm not sure. But I know that at Christmas and at Easter, my non-Christian friends love to gather around the table and remember, and are probably quite unaware 
of how religious that activity is. For me, I, I remember mum and dad's funerals. The main thing that we did in those two days, I went dreading them, and the main thing that we did was gather around tables and eat and remember. We gathered around the table at the home of a family member, mum's home actually, and we ate and we talked and we remembered ourselves. And we went to the church and we gathered around the table there in the Eucharist and we had remembrance. And we ate and drank in remembrance of him who died for us that we might have life eternal. And then we went to the reception afterwards and you know, guess what we did? We gathered around a table in remembrance and we ate some more and we talked some more. And when we got home with the extended family, the brothers and sisters and nephews and nieces, the inner circle, the cousins, the in-laws and the outlaws, you know what we did. We gathered around the table to eat and drink in remembrance. It's always around the table and it's always about remembrance and about food and drink. It's about lamb dinner with bread and wine, a very Aussie custom. Every time there is a wedding or a death or a baptism or a graduation, Traditionally, we would want to gather around the table to eat and drink and remember. Some of us are starving for that. Miles and Claire are going home because they're going to have their wedding. Congratulations. And they're going to gather around the table. And that's what they're longing for, to gather around the table and to remember. Remember other weddings and remember their lives. And mum and dad, no doubt, and best, best, uh, best men and best women will get up and tell stories and remember about how they knew Miles and Claire when they were young. We're all longing to gather around the table with our loved ones and to have remembrance. That's exactly what this night is about. Think about it. Every one of the three readings tonight has two things or three things in common. What are they? Number one, there's a table. And number two, there's a meal, usually lamb. And number three, and wine, and, num and bread. And number three, there's remembrance in all the readings. In Exodus, we have the table of the Passover and the injunction, this day shall be a day of remembrance. In Corinthians, we hear how Jesus gathered his disciples around the table and offered his body and blood and said, do this in remembrance. In the gospel, Jesus washes the disciples' feet and commands love in remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. And he commands them to commemorate the bread and wine, the breaking of the bread and the wine in remembrance of him. And they gather around the table to make new memories. Whenever you eat and drink, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. You know, I don't think that's meant to be just at communion. I think we're meant to do that at home when we have dinner with our family to remember Jesus, body broken and blood shed at every meal. It might be a bit tricky with the cornflakes, but <laughs> dinner definitely. I want to be clear that remembrance is not simply recalling the past. Remembrance, it, it, the word in Greek is anamnesis, and it means the bringing into the past, the present. It means bringing into the present moment, the spirit and the spiritual life of the past. When I worked in Australia as a young man at the Australian Institute of a Aboriginal, um, a Aboriginal Studies in Canberra, which had all the archives of Aboriginal archaeology and study over the last 200 years by Western archaeologists and anthropologists, um, I discovered that, that there was a tradition in many Aboriginal tribes of singing and song cycles, and the sacred song cycles were intended to create an amnesis. Just as we Christians understand, they were intended to invoke the spirits. So as they sing the familiar song cycles, they believed that the presence of the ancestors and the spirits of the, the trees, the animistic, animistic religion basically, would be invoked by the song cycle. And so for us as Christians, we believe that in breaking the bread, we bring the past of Jesus' sacrifice present into our life and our experience now. And we receive the spirit of Christ. I'm sorry, it's, maybe you don't like the comparison of secular with sacred, but it's just fascinated me that, that, um, that animist, animistic people uh, also have that idea of the bringing into remembrance so that the spirit actually comes into the situation. I think maybe in, in their case, maybe in that case, maybe it's not the Holy Spirit. But um, anyway, with that could be debated. But um, the idea is common to our human experience that we long to re-experience the past. 
And Jesus takes this up. He uses this. And he tells us to practice anamnesis, to bring the past spiritually into the present so that the, the spiritual experience of the past impacts us in our, our present now. I would like you just to take a moment to remember what are the remembrances within you. Do you remember Eucharist as a child, communions? Do you remember your parents' fragrance, their smell? Maybe your mother's flower garden, your dad's old spice. Do you remember childhood experiences of church or Palm Sunday and Easter hymns or Easter eggs or Christmas? Do you remember going to the beach or any holidays? What, do you, what are your remembrances? What are your spiritual remembrances? Remembrance is a way of putting us back together as people. When we remember together with our loved ones, we are restored and our identity is strengthened as Christians. Who are we? We are the people who baptize and the people who break bread together. We are the people who come together to be washed and to be fed. When was the last time you gathered around a table in remembrance? The reason, the reason we remember so much and so often is, is because as we remember our faith, it is strengthened and fortified. We bring it back to our present experience. So I invite you tonight to remember, to gather your memories, yourself, your identity, and to bring them into this place and reflect on them. They will give us strength as we carry our cross to Calvary, as we face the sufferings of the world. This gives us strength. We draw strength from the gathering at the table and the re remembering. Let us recall the first Passover, the blood of the Lamb that protected the children of Israel from the angel of death. Let us recall our Lord's Passover from death to life and the new covenant meal he instituted in his body and blood. So as we conclude tonight, I want to conclude with the conversation that Jesus had with the disciples at the end of the meal. You may not know what it was, so I'll refresh your memory. It's in John 14, 1 to 14. As they sat around the table, they must have been asking the question that we all ask at such gatherings. What's the question that we all ask at such gatherings? No, you've already eaten. After the meal, after the end of the gathering, what's the question? Still? Sorry? <laughs> Are you still hungry? <laughs> after party? After party. Oh, dear. <laughs> no, the question is, when will we see each other again? <laughs> The question is, when will we meet again? When will we be, be together again? And there's a country western song written about this. It's called, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? When will the circle be unbroken again? When will we be together again? And when will we be with the ones who are missing tonight? Will we see them again? This is the question that's in the hearts of the disciples. Jesus is going out to Calvary. The circle is about to be smashed. They're about to face the terrible horror of the cross. They don't hardly even know it. And in their hearts, they must have wondered, will the circle be unbroken? Will the fellowship meet again? When will we do this again? When will we share Passover together again? And Jesus says, yes, we will. We will share this fellowship together in my Father's house, in my kingdom. And he tells them four things in this dinner conversation after the meal. He says, number one, I'm going to, anyone know? Prepare a place for you. You know, I think these words are very comforting. As we, as human beings, we want to hold on to our loved ones. We want to hold on to our comfortable situations. We want to hold, we don't want people to, to leave the circle. We don't want the circle to be broken. Of course, the nature of life is that eventually the circle is well broken. But Jesus gives us four things to comfort us. Four things that we can touch and lay hold of. I am going to prepare a place for you. There is a table in heaven in my Father's house. I'm looking forward to that table and that remembering of who we are 
as we all gather and celebrate. I dare say there might even be some barn dancing. And number two, Jesus says to them, Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way. And then he adds a little coda. He says, I am the father of one. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. And Thomas says, show us the father. He says, Thomas, I, I've been with you all this time. Uh, Philip, sorry, not Thomas, Philip. Uh, show us the father. And he says, I've been with you all this time and you don't know me? <laughs> I'm, I'm the father. I'm here. I'm going to prepare a place for you. There's a table in heaven. I'm the way and I am the father. Ask anything in my name and I'll do it for you. I find that incredibly comforting. Sometimes I think about life and, and death and how much longer I have on this earth and the meaning of life. And, and I think about these words. I'm going to prepare a place for you. This is the end of the conversation before he goes out to the cross. He's intending to comfort them. He gives them something they can taste. The smell of bread. I can smell bread. And they not only smell it, they taste it. They have the meal together. And there must have been hugs and embraces, I would guess. And then he says, there's a place for you. And I'm the way. I'm going to prepare it. And I, you can trust me because I am the Father. And you can ask me whatever you need in my name and I will do it. Isn't that comforting? It comforts me. May it comfort you also. Amen. Let us turn to the Mondi on page six. An act of humility, repentance, and renewal. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord Jesus suffered for us, leaving us an example that we might follow in his steps. In his incarnation, he took our human flesh and lived among us for a time. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give up his life for us. Christ died for us once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God in whose image we have been created. In baptism, we have died in the flesh and been made alive in the spirit. We have been buried with Christ that we might share in his resurrection. And as we celebrate the mystery of our Lord's death and resurrection, let us come before God in penitence, praying that God's image in us may be restored and that we may be renewed in the power of the Holy Spirit. I ask you, therefore, do you place your faith in God who created the world and in whose image we, you are made? Do you place your hope in Jesus Christ who died for you and was raised from the dead? Do you place your trust in God's Holy Spirit, who empowers and directs your life in accordance with God's will? Do you repent of the sin which has separated you from God and marred God's image in you? Do you accept again the cleansing from the power of sin, which you first received in your baptism? Will you model your life on the example of your Lord Jesus Christ? Will you take up your cross and follow Christ? Will you seek to serve God and God's people and not only to be served? And will you recognize in others the image of God in which all are made? And will you be faithful in worship, in reading Holy Scripture and in prayer? And will you use your gifts in the service of Christ's body, the church? You have been baptized into the death of Christ and called to a life of humble and loving service to God and to others. All have sinned and fallen short of God's will for us. You have turned to God in penitence and faith and promised to follow in the way of the cross. Receive this water as a sign of forgiveness of your sin, restoration of God's image in you, and of the renewing and restoring power of God's Holy Spirit. So we will now uh, wash the feet of our three candidates. I do invite uh, Crystal and Grace.
and Mark to come forward, that we may recall whose servant we are and remember his teaching and what is done for us is also to be done for others. And as we do this, we will sing number 1261, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You.
Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ taught us that what we do for others, we do also for him. Give us the will to be the servant of others, as he was the servant of all, who gave up his life and died for us, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. I invite us, Miss Selina, to lead us in our intercessions. Thank you, sir. Let us pray. Merciful God, on this the night he was betrayed, your son Jesus Christ washed his disciples' feet. As we commit ourselves to following his example of love and service, teach us humility. God of grace, hear our prayer. On this night, Jesus prayed for his disciples to be one. As we grieve for the divisions in the church, unite us. God of grace, hear our prayer. On this night, Jesus prayed for those who would come to believe through the disciples' message. As we take up the mission of the church, renew our zeal. God of grace, hear our prayer. On this night, Jesus commanded his friends to love but he was rejected. As we open our hearts to the rejected and the unloved, fill us with your love. God of grace, hear our prayer. On this night, Jesus reminded his people that if the world hated them, it had hated him first. As we face our own fears, we pray for those who are persecuted for their faith. Give us your peace. God On this night, Jesus loved his friends to the very end. As we open our hearts to all who face darkness tonight, we pray for the sick, those who mourn, those trapped by violence, addiction, or pain. Give healing to the world and hope. God of grace, hear our prayer. Faithful God, these are the prayers of your church. We offer them trusting and hoping in you. Hear and help us, challenge and change us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Let us stand for the greeting of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. It's hymn number one. Hymn number one, a new commandment. Oh. 
walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become the cup of our salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Worship and praise belong to you, maker of light and darkness. Your wisdom draws beauty from chaos, brings a harvest out of sorrow, and leads the exiles home. In Christ, your Son, enemies are reconciled, debts are forgiven, strangers are made welcome, and we gather at the table of remembrance. Your Spirit frees us to live as sons and daughters in our Father's house. We who by Christ's power walk in the way of the cross, sharing the joy of his obedience and following his example of humility and service, now offer you our praise with the angels and the archangels and the whole company of heaven, singing the hymn of your unending glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Glory and thanksgiving be to you, most loving Father, for Christ in whom the world is reconciled. Lifted on the cross, his suffering and forgiveness spanned the gulf our sins had made. Through that dark struggle, death was swallowed up in victory that life and light might reign. On the night he was given up to suffering and death, recalling the Passover in which the firstborn of Egypt died, and Israel was released from slavery. Your chosen one, your only begotten son, freely offered his life. At supper with his disciples, he took the bread and offered you thanks. He broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body. It is broken for you. And after supper, he took the cup. He offered you thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for you and for all, that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. We now obey your Son's command. We recall his blessed passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. We pray together. May one with him we offer you these gifts, and with them ourselves a single, holy, living sacrifice. Hear us, most merciful Father, and send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and this wine, that overshadowed by your Spirit's life-giving power, they may be the body and blood of your Son, and we may be kindled with the fire of your love and renewed for the service of your kingdom. Help us who are baptized into the fellowship of Christ's body to live and work to your praise and glory. May we grow together in unity and love until at last, in your new creation, we enter into our heritage in the company of the Virgin Mary, the Apostles and the Prophets, and all our brothers and sisters living and departed. We pray all this through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be to you, Lord of all ages, world without end. Amen. And as our Saviour Christ taught his disciples, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Give us the and the of the Father, and for us from evil, for the kingdom of the power of the glory of yours, We who are many are one body in Christ. We all share in one bread. This is my body that is broken for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, says the Lord. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus, Lamb of God, Jesus, bearer of our sins, Jesus, redeemer of the world, brothers and sisters, come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us. And let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do invite you, if you are baptized and believe in Christ, to join with us at his table today. Body of Christ, keep you. The body of Christ, keep you. In the body of Christ was broken for you. The Lord bless you and give you. The body of Christ, keep you. In the, life. the Lord bless you and keep you. To the, life. the body of Christ, keep you. In the, life. the body of Christ was broken for you. we turn back to the bulletin where it says the post communion Jesus said I am the vine and you are the branches they who abide in me and I in them will bear much fruit we pray this post communion prayer as we say together Almighty, Almighty God, God, source of all love whose only begotten Son Psalm 22, a psalm of David. 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out day by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In, our ancestors, in, in you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise to the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. 
they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. <laughs>